You are listening to Off the Shelf, a podcast by The Conference Board. Hello, I'm Amanda Popila, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to this edition of Off the Shelf, a book discussion podcast series brought to you by The Conference Board. Today, I'm here with Bruce Tolgan talking about his latest book, The Art of Being Indispensable at Work. Hello, Amanda. Thank you so much for including me. Thanks for joining us. So Bruce Tolgan is an advisor to business leaders all over the world, a sought after keynote speaker, seminar leader, and consultant. He's the founder of Rainmaker Thinking Inc., a workplace research and training firm, and the author of the bestseller, It's Okay to Be the Boss, as well as many other books. His latest book that we'll be talking about today is The Art of Being Indispensable at Work. This book tells readers how to become a go-to person at work, sharing examples and lessons from real people that we can all relate to. The book focuses on lessons such as how to avoid overcommitment, the difference between real and false influence, when to say yes, how to say no, building relationship power, and how to create an upward spiral of go-toism. So Bruce, I'm really excited to dig into these topics today. Oh, I'm so uh, pleased to be here with you. I love the conference board and I've uh, enjoyed uh, making your acquaintance and I'm honored to be on uh, the podcast. Awesome. So let's get started. In your book, you start by talking about overcommitment and we're in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic right now. Many of us are experiencing stress, burnout, and definitely overcommitment. So you talk about how avoiding this overcommitment is a tool to help many of us, you know, as we're experiencing the the stress that we have right now. So can we be indispensable and also not overcommit ourselves? And how do we do that? Yeah, that is such a great question, Amanda. Look, everybody who's ambitious and service-minded and has a good attitude wants to make themselves valuable, right? You want to be that indispensable go-to person. And especially right now, Everybody has more to do than they have available time and energy. You can't do everything for everybody. Nobody can. But the interesting thing that we've learned in our research is that when people try really hard to be valuable, when people try really hard to be indispensable, the number one thing that gets in their way, no matter how good their attitude is, no matter how good they are at their job, uh, no matter how much they want to serve, The number one thing that will get in your way and undermine your ability to be indispensable is if you get overcommitted, right? So if you say yes, 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 because you so want to please, you so want to add value, you so want to be of service, eventually you have too much to do and not enough time. You keep saying yes, you're juggling. If you're juggling, you're going to drop the ball. And the irony is that if you don't have a methodical, professional, systematic approach to serving others, then uh, no matter how good your attitude is, no matter how much you want to serve, if you don't have a a methodical, professional, systematic approach, uh, you are always going to be in danger of overcommitment syndrome. And once you're drowning in overcommitment, you're, you're bound to start making mistakes uh, and, and causing delays and ending up with relationship friction, which is exactly the opposite of what you're trying to do. Uh, so um, one of the insights that I tried to share that, that comes out of our research is the number one thing you've got to do is fight overcommitment syndrome or else there's no way you will be a go-to person who stands the test of time. Um, you know, maybe you could be a go-to person today, tomorrow, this week, this month, but pretty soon you're going to burn out. And at the very best case, if you let yourself get overcommitted, you'll be one of those people who's inconsistent. They'll say, I don't know, sometimes Bruce does a great job, but sometimes he drops the ball. And, and, and why is that? It's because I'm overcommitted. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess the next natural question is, how do you do this? I mean, you're talking, you know, people, and I have felt this, you're always saying yes, knowing that maybe I can't do everything, but not wanting to drop that ball. So when should you say yes? When should you say no? And how do you say no? 
Well, you know, you've got to keep front and center in your mind a true service mindset. So you don't say no because, oh, I, I, I just don't have a minute. Um, okay, well, if you just don't have a minute, you might have to say no, but then you find yourself saying no to some really good things. And often it's because you said yes to the wrong things, right? So a good yes is, uh, is what you're looking for. And a good no is all about freeing up time and energy for a better yes. So I often tell people, you have to play the long game one moment at a time. Uh, often people want to say yes in the moment because they're thinking about the transaction. Somebody's asking them and they don't want to disappoint them in the moment. Uh, but you have to think a little bit around the corner to when you are going to be delivering for this person or not. Right. So what if this is something you cannot do, either because you've allowed yourself to become overcommitted and you just don't have the time or you cannot do it because you don't know how or you cannot do it because you don't have the tools or you can't do it because two plus two can never equal five. Right. You just can't do it. Or what if you're not allowed to do it? It's against the rules. Right. Or what if you really shouldn't do it? It's it shouldn't be your next priority. You're not the right person for it. Maybe it's not a great idea. Those are the three reasons to say no. So if you cannot do it, it's easy. If you say yes, you're going to disappoint. If you're not allowed to do it, it should be easy because if you do it, you're going to get in trouble or you should get in trouble. Somebody's going to get in trouble. And if you shouldn't do it, okay. Now that's where it gets tricky. That's where you have to make a decision. So you have to get really good at making decisions uh, about yes and no. And the first thing is keep service in mind, right? Is this something I'm going to be able to do very well uh, in a decent amount of time uh, that it's going to have a good return on investment? Am I a good person for this? Is this something I'm supposed to do? And one of the things you have to do is be aligned with your boss. So look, if your boss asks you to do it, you know, then maybe you don't have a choice, but you still want to be able to go have a conversation with your boss and say, gee, you know me, I, I aim to please. Uh, here, here's why I, I don't think I can do it or I don't think I should do it. But so often these requests come from lateral colleagues in today's high collaboration workplace or diagonal colleagues. Uh, and so often you're the one making the ask. And so when you're inundated by requests, how do you decide when to say no? And the answer is you've got to really pay closer attention to the ask. The ask is the moment to slow down and drill down. And you can be very responsive and very service minded and very professional and very methodical by really treating people's requests with respect, by really paying attention to their ask asking good questions of the ask, uh, and taking notes. Pay attention. Take notes. Then somebody who's asking you can see, and this is true if it's your boss or your direct reports or your sideways colleagues or your customers, anyone who's asking something of you. You want to ask questions of the ask. Help them fine-tune their ask and take notes. So then what you're doing is you're putting yourself in a position to make a better decision. But you're also in the process showing respect for their needs and showing respect for their ask and showing them that you're not just jumping to a decision because you say yes to everything or you're jumping to a decision because you say no to everything or because you're drowning. You're really considering their request. So that process, the ask, is the part that gets glossed over. And the ask is where we need to slow down and spend more time. And that's how you make good decisions because yes is where all the action is. Once you get to the yes, you're making a commitment and you will be known for the yeses you deliver on. You will be known for the yeses on which you don't deliver far more than the asks to which you say no for very good reason. And if you become known for making good decisions, if you become known for saying no for the right reasons at the right times, if you become no for following through when you say yes, then you also have more and more power to say no because people know that's how you operate.
I love that. So it's not just saying yes to everything. It's not saying yes to the people that you want to help and no to the people that you don't like, but it's actually having a methodology around why do you say yes? When do you say yes? And when do you say no? That's really, really helpful. Yeah, it's, it's, due, it's due diligence and you got to do your due diligence. And the, the formula should be what is the greatest opportunity for you to spend your time and energy truly adding the most value? Where do other people's needs and requests meet up with your ability to add value? That's great. So you touched a little bit on this, and and I want to get back to the people that you're not only helping, but also where you go for help, because you're not always you're not always only helping your boss or somebody ahead of you. Sometimes it is lateral, and sometimes you need those people to get your job done as well. So let's talk about influence, and and how do you influence people that you might not have kind of direct line of sight to? What's and I know you talk in the book about real influence and false influence. So can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah, the best way to think about it is think of influence as a noun, not a verb. So you, if you think of an influence as a verb, I'm going to influence you. It leads you in the wrong direction. So if you you know I'm going to use my influence to get what I need from you. That's not how influence works. That's not how real influence works. Right. So um, sometimes people think of influence as a stand in for authority, but it's a weak stand in. See, authority means that I can require it of you. And if, if you do it, I can reward you. Or if you don't do it, I can withhold rewards or I can impose some penalty. Right. That I have position power. And if you don't have position power, people say, well, if you don't have authority, you have to use influence. And I think that leads a lot of people in the wrong direction. Because when you try to use influence, what am I going to do? Badger you? Right? Well, then it, uh, actually the noun influence, which is what your opinion of me is, right? My influence lives in your brain. My influence is my reputation. My influence is, do you want to help me? Do you want me to want to work with you? Do you want to work with me? Right? So that's real influence. When I go to you and you want to do something with me. You want to do something for me because you know that when you ask me for something, I give you a good no or a good yes. When I give you a yes, I make a plan and I deliver. When I come to you with an ask, it's a well thought out ask. It's fine tuned. It's in clear terms. I go to you. I don't go to you. If you're a dentist, I don't go to you and ask you to make me a will. If you're a lawyer, I don't go and ask you to fix my cavity, right? I go to you when it's the right time. So I do my homework about, I go to you for the right things at the right, you go to the right person for those things and be a good customer. Go and and help the other person help you and make it easier for them to serve you. And so influence is a long game, Amanda. Uh, influence is not a short-term process. You know, some people think of influence as like influence peddling. I could bribe you or, Hey, if you don't do this for me, when you need something from me, then I'm going to withhold my support. Or if you don't do this for me, I'm going to be mean to you or, uh, you know, whatever. Those are all forms of false influence. It's when you're trying to influence someone else. Influence is a long game. You build up your influence by being someone who shows up with a great attitude, shows up with a service mindset, somebody who knows what you can do well. So that like, say, if you come to me and ask me to do something and I'm not good at it, I might say, hey, I've never done this before, but I'd be willing to try. But I want to be really honest with you. First, I'm going to have to learn, right? So that's how I operate. I'm transparent. I treat relationships as if they're ongoing. I treat people with respect. I make promises only when I can deliver. And when you conduct yourself that way one moment at a time, then over time you build up your influence, your reputation, what other people think of you. And then when you go to them, uh, you, you conduct yourself like a really effective customer, go to the right person for the right things, go well prepared, go with a clear ask, offer to help them help you. That's how you conduct yourself in such a way that makes it much more likely other people are going to want to deliver for you and are going to deliver for you. 
Yeah, it's striking me. It seems like this whole process of becoming indispensable is just about being intentional and having a plan and being thoughtful about how you're responding to people in the workplace. Yeah, it's being intentional, having a plan, being thoughtful, but also putting service first. And that doesn't mean I'll do whatever you need, whatever you want, regardless of my ability. It means I'm going to approach every relationship and every interaction trying to add maximum value. So if you come to me and say, hey, I need you to move all these boxes with this forklift, and I say, I don't know how to drive a forklift, right? So, so I would not be doing you any favors if I was like, oh, yeah, I'll do that. Well, you know, then you come into the warehouse and the forklift is broken and all the boxes are all over the room. And you're like, hey, why didn't you tell me you don't know how to drive a forklift? Yeah. So we want to continue this conversation, but we need to take a quick break for some announcements. And we'll be back in just a minute. Um, I'm here with Bruce Tolgan on his book, The Art of Being Indispensable at Work. Thanks, Bruce. Can you, your team, or your company benefit from insights such as the ones provided in this podcast? They are immediately available when you join the Conference Board, a membership-based think tank that delivers trusted insights for what's ahead. Reaching across industries and geographies, we bring together our noted experts, senior executives from the world's largest companies, and nonpartisan practical research to help you address your most important business issues. Our membership packages are tailored to your organization's unique needs and budget. To learn more about our offerings, go to www.conferenceboard.org and click join on the top bar to connect with one of our product specialists. Hello, and welcome back to our conversation with Bruce Tolgan on his book, The Art of Being Indispensable at Work. So, Bruce, in your book, I loved the description you had of a woman that you worked with who you talked about was constantly going from one task to another. She had all these things that she was juggling and was seemingly a go-to person because everybody went to her and asked her for things, but she wasn't getting things done. She wasn't finishing the tasks. So that was something that I really related to, and and I know others that are listening to this are, can probably relate to that. So how do we change this? How can we go from kind of this always juggling mode to actually getting things done? Yeah, the juggler. It's so common. People say, oh, I'm so busy. I'm always juggling. And then I'm always, I'm always standing there trying to figure out if they're telling me that as a badge of honor or if they're asking for my advice because – I usually have to say to them, hey, um, if you're always juggling, eventually you're going to drop a ball. And usually when you drop a ball because you're juggling, you don't choose which ball to drop. So sometimes they all drop for a little while um, and then you have a hard time picking them up. Uh, look, y- y- you know, everybody's so busy and people say to me, well, well what, what's the solution? You got to finish what you start. And that means you got to execute one concrete action at a time and focus like a laser beam. Now, sometimes people will say to me, well, then how do I take on more and more things? I have a growing to-do list. I have a wide range of tasks and responsibilities. I get interrupted all the time. I have meetings scheduled all day long. So I'm forced to juggle. And the reality is, uh, no, if, if you look at the data, the people who get the most work done are the ones who carve their work into smaller chunks of doable concrete actions and then look for gaps in their schedule for focused execution time. So the longer your to-do list, the more work you have, the less you can afford to juggle. And the longer your to-do list, the more important it is every day to make a do list, a realistic do list, concrete actions you are going to finish today. If you have a busy schedule, then the first thing you have to do is look at that schedule and make sure that everything that's plugged into that schedule is a high priority appointment. And uh, sometimes in today's environment, you have to start making decisions about which meetings are the ones not where the big shots are so you want to be there, not the ones that are more fun or easier to be at, but the ones where you have a clear opportunity to add value. Uh, But the busier your schedule, uh, the more important it is to look for gaps in your schedule. Uh, Because it turns out that what 
the most effective execution happens in 15 to 45 minute chunks of time. Uh, if you think you're juggling, people say I'm multitasking. Turns out there's no such thing. The brain doesn't do that. Now, you can shift your attention as many as seven times in a second. But when you're always shifting your attention, you're much less effective. And the more you learn to focus on chunks of executable concrete actions in clear time frames that you set aside for execution, that's how you start getting things done. That's awesome. So, and as you were talking, I was thinking about meetings. And so I know, you know, joining only the meetings where you can add value and being, again, intentional about which meetings you join. Can you talk a little bit more about how we communicate with people? Because I think even now during the pandemic, we're hearing of more meetings, more Zoom fatigue, more unstructured communications because things are changing so much more quickly than maybe they had in the past, um, or we need to communicate things fast and we need to get things done. So do you have any other tips or thoughts about how we're communicating now and how we should think about our meetings and our unstructured communications? Yeah, you've got to put more and more structure into your communication because, uh, look, nobody's at their best when they're being interrupted. If I interrupt you, you have to pull your attention out of what you're doing and try to tune into me. What your brain wants to do is get back to what you were doing. So you're much more likely to not slow down, pay attention to my ask, or slow down and make sure that I'm giving you a, a good no or a good yes and uh, that there's a plan and next steps. Um, you're, you're just trying to, to get back to what you were doing. And that's true of the people you're interrupting also. So, you know, if we're interrupting each other all day, we're, we're rendering ourselves suboptimal in our communication and in our focus and in our effectiveness and clarity. And uh, the strong likelihood is we're also, you know, if we're interrupting each other all day long, then it's so hard for people to have focused communication. So I always say, look, if the building's on fire, interrupt. Otherwise, set a time. And that's not to say that you can't have plenty of casual interaction. But there's too much talk in the workplace about everything under the sun. There's not enough focused talk about the work that needs to get done. And so we interrupt each other all day long. We touch base with each other. How's everything going? Everything on track? We're on emails. We text. So email and text are great because they're asynchronous communication. But we have to make clear that, okay, I might send you an email, but I don't expect you to respond immediately that we should make clear to each other, hey, I have my response times. I respond between four and five, let's say, right? Because we have to decide what communication needs to be synchronized and what doesn't. And meetings should be held not for the sake of meetings, but only for a good reason. One-on-one -on -one communication is often better. When you plan your conversation, you're much more likely to take notes in advance. You're much more likely to go uh, in order of the things you need discussed rather than what's at the top of your head. So the answer is structure, structure, structure. Uh, whoever are your most frequent interrupters, schedule the regular one-on-one -on -one with them. And then ask yourself, am I anybody's most frequent interrupter? And, and try to put more structure into that communication as well. Thank you. So we've talked a lot about what we can do as individuals. And I, I wanted to ask about how to build a team or even an organization of indispensable people. So, you know, for the leaders or the HR professionals who might be listening um, or anyone who's in charge of a team, how do we foster this culture of go-toism uh, in our organizations? Well, wherever you are, right, whatever role you're in, the first person you have to manage every day is yourself. The second person you have to manage every day is your boss. The third person you have to manage every day is anyone who reports to you. Uh, and then, okay, who else can I get to today? Who else am I going to focus on today? But the most important thing is to show up the way you are trying to show up. Practice being the person you're trying to become. And then uh, find go-to people wherever you need them. 
Uh, know who's who. Uh, know who is is the person to go to for one thing as opposed to another, right? So you want to know, hey, what what are your specialties, uh, and what are the things you want to tackle and make a new specialty, and then you want to also try to build up new go to people. Whenever you have the chance, uh, build up new go-to people to back you up, build up new go-to people by giving them a chance to do something they haven't done, even if it's not their specialty yet, if you have a little time for them to learn. That's how you can spread this approach, even if you're not a leader, right? Um, So what if, oh, is it going to be a click, your go-to people? Well, sure, it might be a click. But how about everybody's welcome in your clique as long as they show up with a good attitude and ready to carry their own weight and do their part? And you say, oh, well, can everybody be a go-to person? Well, would you want to have a team where, no, no, you don't want to go to that person, right? (laughs) You know, who wants to be on that team? But look, you can't change a whole organization all by yourself. If you're the CEO, if you're uh, the head of HR, if you're in a very senior role, then you can uh, drive this mindset and conduct throughout your organization. But my view is wherever you are, whatever role you're in, if you teach your colleagues the best practices that I've been describing here, you know, it's not rocket science. It's take a walk every day and eat your vegetables. Do the right things in the right order for the right reasons. Uh, Be candid with people. Uh, Respect other people's needs. Uh, Try to add value in everything you do. And there are some very concrete techniques for doing that. Vertical alignment, structured communication, due diligence, paying attention to every ask, focusing on execution. Uh, developing a repertoire of specialties so that people know what to go to you for, right? If you, you want to know who to go to for things, so you should also know what you want to be known for. These are our, our best practices that we've gotten too far away from. They're basics that we've, most of us have gotten too far away from. So, you know, I encourage leaders to push this mindset through their organization. This is what fuels collaboration. This is how you push authority down the chain of command. This is how you empower people to work more effectively with each other. And no matter where you are in the organization, you can make a difference uh, by by behaving this way and by thinking this way and, and by having confidence that the more value you add, the more you make things better for yourself and for everyone else. Yeah, so all of us can model those behaviors. And when you're talking about having the click, it would be great to have an organization with just a, a click of go-to people. That just sounds awesome. Yeah, it's like special forces. Yeah. So, I, you know, I mentioned a few times we're in the middle of the pandemic. You know, it's all anybody's talking about right now. But I don't think any of this really changes in this remote virtual world or, you know, in the world that we're in. Um Have you thought about, does any of your advice change because of COVID or is anything more important or more critical now than it was in the past? Or what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, I wrote this book for a world in which uh, people deal with a lot of uncertainty. Uh, People are overcommitted and people are operating where they have to deal with more people than ever before and lines of authority are less clear than ever before. Uh, So, you know, I think that I didn't write the book for the pandemic. I, yeah. I didn't write the book for the pandemic, but I might as well have. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. It, it just, it seems to all fit with where we are now. And I know you'd written it before, but uh, that's great. Okay. Well, I am just, I love the conference board. Uh, I'm, I, I, I'm really loving getting to know you and, and your colleagues. And I'm just thrilled to be able to add value. Wonderful. Well, can you, we're almost out of time. Can you just share what's next for you? Are you working on a new project now? Oh, you know, we uh, put a production studio into our office. So we're creating a lot of video training and doing a lot of remote seminars and a lot of remote talent assessments for organizations and organizational assessments and team assessments. And uh, I am flirting with, you know, what to write next also. 
and uh, my wife is just about to finish her second book. So uh, I've been a little distracted by by that hubbub because, you know, I finish a book every other year, but she only finishes a book once a decade. Of course, her books are really good. That's great. Well, thank you. Thanks, Bruce, uh, for speaking with us today. Thanks to our listeners for tuning into this conversation. And if you'd like to learn more about Bruce's work, visit RainmakerThinking.com. If you've enjoyed this episode of Off the Shelf, please subscribe to our book discussion podcast series or explore our entire catalog of podcast programming uh, from the conference board at conferenceboard.org slash podcasts. This is Amanda Popula from the Conference Board, and thank you for joining us for this edition of Off the Shelf. This has been Off the Shelf, a podcast by the Conference Board.